my, my name is Catherine Call, and I'm the Dean of Social Sciences here at UVic. I wish to begin by acknowledging with respect the history, customs, and culture of the Coast Salish and Strait Salish people on whose traditional lands we meet here tonight. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Idea Fest and to our Faculty of Social Science event. Uh, we've entitled it Getting Personal, Social Scientists Share True Stories from Their Research. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. I think you're in for a really interesting evening. I've been looking forward to this event for quite some time. I know that all of our faculty have been working very hard on their stories, so I hope you're going to sit back and enjoy their performances. I think it's going to be quite uh, different than maybe what you have been used to. As someone just told me, it was probably one of the most difficult things to do to write outside of an academic space. So um, I think that we're going to uh, uh, be you know, in for some really interesting insights. Um, each, each talk is going to be uh, about 10 minutes in length. And at the end, there's going to be time for questions. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight, Jeremy Loveday. Jeremy is a spoken word performer and a poetry slam artist, and most recently, a city councillor. So please join me and welcome Jeremy. That's right, you elected a poet. Uh, <laughs> welcome, and uh, I'm, I'm also very excited about tonight's event, and it's a great to see a full room uh, to, to get personal, which is what we're doing this evening. And so we have some of UBIT's brightest and most accomplished social scientists here to share personal stories from their research, or the stories that led to their research. And a couple months ago, I was asked to lead a storytelling workshop um, in, in the lead up to this event and for the academics who are going to speak. And I don't know, have you ever signed up for something and then once you get all of the information, you uh, feel very nervous? <laughs> that was how I felt when I read the bios of these speakers. Um, it, and we came together and we had, we had a workshop and I want to acknowledge that to write outside of your comfort zone and to share your personal stories, it takes courage and it takes vulnerability. And so I want us to guarantee to our speakers that we're going to be a warm and receptive audience. And, and then we will and then we'll be I don't know what's going on there. But I have a sense you're with me, by the way. Because it already feels great in here. So thank you. Um, this, this process has been a, a real honor for me to be a part of, and I'm excited to be your host for the evening and to uh, basically introduce our speakers. And before doing that, I'll leave you with a couple quotes about storytelling. Um, I was doing a little research just today, trying to figure out what I was gonna say to open this, this night, and I, I found two quotes. One is by an, an author named Philip Pullman, and it's after nourishment, Shelter and companionship, stories are the thing we need the most in the world. And the second, and I think, I think this one is really fitting when I'm about to introduce uh, some of UVic's most accomplished academics. This is uh, by Ken Kesey, and it's to hell with the facts, we need stories. <laughs> so on that note, we have uh, our first speaker um, is Rebecca Nellums. And so her bio goes like this. Rebecca Nellums is a PhD student in sociology and the, and the cultural, social, and political thought program at UVic, and a 2015 Trudeau scholar. Her research involves talking to upper high school Canadian youth about their experiences of empathy, so we can better understand and learn from them about how the, how the contemporary online world is changing the way we interact with one another and the world around us. When she's not thinking about empathy, she's more often than not wearing a cape and hanging out in her kids' imaginary world with them. And I think so let's give a really, really warm welcome to her.
my internet journey okay? At four, I feel shame for the first time. At four, I learn friends can be mean. But all this fades away on the day I turn five, as I watch my friend Michael running down the street towards me, present in hand, and a look on his face that tells me there's no one in the world like me. At six, my parents adopt four children, making us a family of nine, if you don't count the dogs. There's always room for one more, or four, even when moving across the country in a brown station wagon. But at seven, I see a homeless man for the first time from inside that station wagon window. And I can't for the life of me understand why there isn't room for him. Or why it's my dad's job to save lives every day, but it's not his job to help that man. It's my last day of grade three, and my mom takes me to the store to buy me comfort. She tells me we're moving the next day, again. The fifth time, the fifth home, the fifth city, the third country in my eight years on this planet. But there is no fooling me. There is no Hello Kitty doll that's ever going to replace the friend I just made and lost again. At 12, my friend and I gaze at the stars like questions in their vastness. She wants answers while I luxuriate in the wonder that there are things I will never know. At 13, I have now moved enough times to have a respectable sample size. A sociologist at heart, I noticed my first trend, that the rules for who is cool in the schoolyard are just made up fairy tales, because they're never the same anywhere. At 15, I see it isn't just kids who author these fairy tales, that us them groups spill far beyond the gates of the schoolyard. At 16, I learn I am not the free-floating, detached, nomadic atom that I thought I was. My shoes are planted, embedded in systems, histories, and life worlds. I learn my ancestors were among the first seven settler families to occupy Stolo Nation land. I was renamed on the shores of the Stolo River, just like the river itself. And my shoes bear traces of those shores wherever I go. On the shores of another mighty river, many miles away, stands another 16-year-old. One who I meet many years later, dispossessed not by settlers, but a storm. He's in New Orleans, and though it's four years after Hurricane Katrina, there's no relief in sight for him. Torn from his family, he has to defend himself and fight to carve out space and a place on what will always be someone else's turf. No address or place to call home in a landscape, though flooded, that's barren of resources and support. He creates lifelines. He finds a new family for whom he stands <coughs> at home, the gang leader. When I meet him, he and a handful of other youth gang leaders are participants in a psychosocial program that I have come to New Orleans to evaluate. The program is a last-ditch effort before they're kicked out of the school system for good. Kicked out for being violent in a violent world. The program for them is mandatory because it's their last chance, as if they've ever had any chances before. They're used to being pushed onto new turf, but this is turf they've never faced before. They're given space here, but they're not sure they want it. Their discomfort is palpable. They're asked to reflect, not act. To feel and talk, to listen and hear. Harder than any fight they've ever been in. I watch them as they wrestle with one another, with themselves, as they slam up against their differences, as they slam up against their pain. And right when they stand in their greatest frustration, realizing no one will ever know what it's like to be them, they catch a glimpse of each other for the first time. 
They realize if no one can ever know what it's like to be them, then they can never assume to know what it's like to be someone else. And ironically, it's in this moment of being unknown that they feel seen for the first time. Everything changes in that moment. Everything they thought they knew about each other before comes undone. The walls between them start to crumble. In curiosity, they can't help but step towards each other, but not to stand in each other's shoes. They know they can't. Instead, they find themselves standing with each other, before each other, in the discomfort of the gap between them. Their lives are forever changed in that moment, and so are their schools and neighborhoods. In a matter of six weeks, they go from being gang leaders to peace builders. They turn all their leadership skills and ability to forge bonds towards creating lifelines all around them. They intervene in others' battles, they forge peace and agreements, and they do this not by creating a common ground or standing in the same place, by merging gangs or thinking they now get each other, but by finding a way to face one another in their impenetrability, on a turf not made out of knowledge of the other, but out of respect for what they don't know, what they can't assume about one another. For them, it's that split moment, that blink of a moment that you question yourself instead of thinking you know the other, that you pause before acting, before erasing the other. It's that shadow of a doubt that saves a life. Maybe empathy is not the capacity to place oneself in another's position, or the ability to imagine what it's like to be in their shoes. Why would you keep listening to someone once you thought you knew what it was like to be them? And once you've stood in another's shoes, experienced what it's like to be them, what stops you from simply slipping out of those shoes again and walking away from the other whenever you so choose, unchanged by the experience, as if stepping off a fairground ride, unscathed? And if empathy is no more than an individual capacity or ability or trait, does the other even need to be there anymore? I mean, how are they supposed to stay when you're standing in their shoes? I'm still 16. I imagine an empathy that's not about settling into another's shoes, but the willingness to first take a good long look at our own. I'm still 15. Maybe oneness isn't something we get to experience without slamming up against what separates us. I'm still... Oh my god, no. I'm still 13. I imagine an empathy that's about encountering a very distant other whose shoes you know you could never stand in, or even fully see, and you maybe even painfully step into the gap between you, the silence, the distance. I'm still 12. What if empathy is not about knowing or recognizing the other, but unraveling and unlearning what we thought we knew about them? I'm still 8. Kids always know where human connection is, and where it isn't. We should listen to them. I'm still seven. So often what we rationalize at every turn of the road makes no sense at all. Any kid can tell you that. I'm still six. There's always room for one more, or four, and if there isn't, it is time to leave the station wagon behind, not one another. I mean, where the hell do we think we're going anyway? I'm still five, I'm still four. I still feel shame and get kept by cruelty, but these always fade from sight, the moment a friend rounds the corner, running towards me, with the gift of connection and a look on their face that tells me there's no one in the world so like me. Conservation Foundation. She is a conservation scientist who studies species at risk 
ecosystem interactions, and human influences in the coastal environments. Mm. Studying bears, birds, whales, herring, and humans, Carolyn is happiest when exploring this wild Pacific coast. So
all the short-tailed albatrosses numbering in the millions, perhaps even tens of millions, had all been counted. And in 1949, a scientific obituary for the species once known as the 50-foot seagull was written. Just like that, the species was thought to have joined the ranks of extinct, including other additions like great odds and passenger pigeons. Instead, short-tails uh, they saved themselves. What saved them was their own life history strategy, and diversity in their DNA, a heck of a lot of luck, and then later, positive human intervention. Taking six years or more to attain maturity, young short-tails spend that time at sea. And it's thought, there's not a lot of information, but it's thought just 50 individuals survived. And they spent that time growing up amongst the deep sea waves of the Pacific. But in the 1950s, a meteorologist on Traditional Island spotted leaders. The handful of birds that had matured for those years at sea had finally come home to breed. And their return, against all odds, in addition to a shockingly low population size, finally brought about a radical change in human attitudes. So they are now considered a national treasure in Japan, and the birds and their major colonies, the ones that are known, have been protected by law and international treaties for many years. The world's population is at 3,500 birds, and that's remarkable given that they went from 50 individuals to 3,500 in just 16 years. And so the outlook for short tails and going into the future is definitely brighter. They still require a high degree of intervention in terms of conservation. In addition to having a very small population, they live and breed on a volcano. And they face, as they roam across the Pacific, numerous hazards, including conflict with fisheries, small oil spills, ingestion of plastics, and a rapidly changing climate. But before the world's population of short-tailed albatrosses was decimated, this species was BC's most abundant near shore albatross, including the waters of the Salish Sea. So their abundance, their large size, and their incredible <coughs> behavior are incredibly bold. We have them a source of food for indigenous peoples. Their bones, sometimes found in significant quantities in ancient ruins, signal their importance to this coast. So from Lipa Sound, Haida Gwaii, closer to Esquimalt and Pender Island, their remains in ancient ruins indicates their historical presence on this coast. And more than their presence, the remains speak to this entwined history they have with human cultures on the coast. Seemingly exotic and far flung as readers of Japan and wanderers of the Wild Pacific, short-tailed albatrosses are embedded in the history of oral physical of this coast. And I try to imagine a place where pink-billed, 50-footed seagulls trail in the wake of our BC fairies and fish boats. But it really is at present a distant reality. In the slow crawl, out of what was thought to be their death spiral to extinction, short-tailed albatrosses still need our protection and will need it likely for centuries, if not hundreds of years to come. They're still rare on this coast. In all, we've documented less than 100 birds since the 1990s. That really obscures the fact that many more of these birds wander this coast undetected by human eyes. As a population continues to recover, more and more will come every year. And like elsewhere in the Pacific, they will have to contend with our floating trash that looks too much like food, our baited fishing hooks, and our pollution all of which occurs in an ocean that is changing at a rapid pace. Listed as threatened in Canada, and ranked among the rarest of the world's albatrosses, I wonder if I'll ever meet one again. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker uh, is Rita Tromley. And Rita's talk is called Politics of Resistance and Domination. She's a professor of political science. Dr. Tremblay is a political scientist who explores the relationship between territorial and cultural identities and examines the tensions and contradictions between formal and informal nationalisms in South Asia. She began her research on the Indian state of Kashmir when the valley became embroiled in a secessionist movement in 1989. Please give a really warm round of applause for Rita. There's a map here, the ones, uh, if you're not familiar with India and, and Jammu Kashmir. Kashmir is 
uh, right on northwest bordering Pakistan and, uh, and China. In 1947, uh, the state gets divided up into two parts. There's a tribal invasion from Pakistan, and as a result of that, you have two thirds of uh, uh, Kashmir with India, one third with Pakistan. There are three wars which have been fought over the issue of Kashmir uh, over, over the years. Uh, there is a conflict within Kashmir itself. Kashmiri people feel that Indian state has uh, not fulfilled its promise in regard to self-determination, and over and over the years, it has slowly, slowly integrated the state uh, into, into India. Since 1989, as Jeremy mentioned, there has been a mass-based secessionist movement in the valley, uh, accompanied by a political insurgency, which was fundamentally fueled by uh, uh, Islamic uh, groups trained in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the conflict is a bit muted now, uh, but the impact stays. Uh, as, as I mentioned here somewhere, uh, there was at the height of the movement, there were about 700,000 Indian security forces in the valley. Uh, 100,000 people have died. 10,000 people have disappeared. About two or three years ago, 2,000 mass graves were found. Uh, despite the Indian state's uh, uh, denial that uh, the disappearance was because of them. There have been huge human rights violations by Indian security forces, including uh, mass rape in one village uh, seven years ago. Uh, you have had uh, forced migration of Hindu minority from the valley, and two generations of young people who have grown up in violence, both militant violence as well as state violence. I grew up uh, in that state in the 1950s, in the valley in 1950s and 1960s. No guessing up my age, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess. You can guess. Very uh, You will get some indication of how old I am, probably from here. I was a part of Hindu minority. Uh, valley is 90%, 94% Muslim. Hindus are about 4%, and the rest of the population is Buddhist and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sikhs. I felt very fortunate uh, to have grown up uh, in, uh, in the valley and feel that my formative years uh, in the valley, about 20 years or so, uh, have, were just absolutely marvelous. The ones who have heard about Kashmir, uh, and it is most, one of the most exquisite place in the world, surrounded by the Himalayan mountains. It has uh, lakes, uh, it's five rivers which originate from Tibet, flow through the through the valley, Indus is the famous one. Uh, it is just one of the rulers, for example, in the 16th century said, if there's a paradise on this earth, it is here, it is here, it is here. And I really truly believe that it is one of those extreme places. But when I say that I was very fortunate to grow up, uh, grew up in the valley, I'm not talking about physical beauty. I'm talking about the culture, the synthetic cultural values which I received while growing up. And that's called, the critical Kashmiri identity is called Kashmiri There's no literal translation of this word, but it means brotherhood. It means uh, a, uh, a tolerance for difference. It means respect for the other. It also implies forgiveness. And it is a uh, identity which uh, originates actually in the 14th century, 14th, 15th century in, in, in the valley really believes in transcending all divisive religious and political affiliations. The introduction of this particular ethnic identity is very much related to the introduction of Sufi Islam in the valley. Sufi Islam was introduced in the valley in the 14th century by Shah Hamdan, who came from Persia. So he was traveling from Persia, and he comes to the valley, introduces Sufi Islam. And you know, the ones who know Sufi Islam is a mystical Islam. And it's Islam which believes in, uh, in divine love and finding the truth through a direct experience with God. But most fundamentally, it speaks to tolerance. And so the Kashmiri identity emerges out of that. And when I talk about Sufi Islam, uh, Shah Hamdan brought something else. He brought to the valley, by traveling, a very fine wool, and it's called Pashmina wool. And Pashmina wool was introduced to, to the valley, and they built, the people built a whole economy around it, Pashmina shawls, embroidered beautiful Pashmina shawls, 
and the Kashmir wool, all of which you are familiar with. And here I have a picture of Empress Josephine. And when Napoleon was in Egypt in 1798, he sends a gift to uh, Empress Josephine, uh, the shawl dress with the embroidery, Kashmiri embroidery. And she says to her son, I don't know whether it will catch on as a fashion or not. But she introduces it. And all of us now not only wear real pashmina, we wear synthetic pashmina and synthetic shawls. But it was the pashmina shawl uh, and the embroidery which comes with that. But coming back to Sufism, what it does is that not only this pashmina wool introduces a kind of economy, but it's an economy which, become, which originates, which becomes a very interdependent economy between the communities, between Muslims and Hindus, but also a ritual interdependence of the two communities. So you have Muslims who participate, participate, have participated since the 15th century in the weddings of Hindu weddings. Muslims, for example, have a very particular role to perform in a Hindu, Kashmiri Hindu wedding of barber uh, showing the mirror. Uh, Muslims, for example, have been very much responsible for all the pilgrimages, Hindu pilgrimages which take place. Hindus, on the other hand, uh, go to Sufi shrines. That's a very, very important uh, part of, of our lives. When I got married in 1975, many, many years ago, uh, and my parents, with condition, I married a, a white person. That's why my name is Trumpet. <laughs> and my tradition was those days, girls did, Hindu girls did not marry white men. Uh, and so condition was to have to come home and get married. And so the two things which I remember of our wedding is that first of all, uh, my husband, the groom has to get ready in some other house to come to the bride's house. So he is our Muslim friends who hosted him and who hosted his family. And uh, when he came to the bride's house, his biggest regret is that he did not ride an elephant, he rode an ambassador car. <laughs> but, uh, but the second condition was that we had to visit the Sufi shop. So that was the first thing we had to do after we got married, because all Hindus really thanked their good fortune uh, and went to the rishis and to the Sufis to thank them. Uh, if anybody would forget what it means to be, uh, to have this Kashmiri identity, the Srinagar city is surrounded, you can see that mountain, it's called Hari Parvat. It has a Hindu name and it's a Muslim name. And it, it is visible everywhere where you are in the city. The top of it has a Muslim mosque, middle has a Hindu temple, and the bottom has a Sikh Gurdwara. So synthetic identity is very much. So that was part of my formative years. But at the same time, I also had not so normal uh, youth. And that's within the political arena. As I mentioned, the Kashmiri population felt from the very beginning that they had been cheated out of the right to self-determination, conflict with the Indian state. So I grew up in a very coercive state. From the very beginning, the army and the security forces were all around the town. We never went anywhere without, without seeing the army. So army was all over. Uh, you also not only had this coercive arm of the state, but you also had resistance at the same time. So even a tiny little thing which would go wrong, for example, the price of onions going up, or you have a shortage of electricity, or when we went to school and college, our provincial exam, exam was tough and there was a strike, you know, everybody kind of puts their paper and go, it becomes a mass of, mass of students around there, would become a political, political event. And in this political event, the slogan which would be raised, this is our Kashmir, and we'll decide this is future. Most of the time, the security forces were told to be just to restrain themselves, to not, do not really alienate the population more. But state's arm was also very, very big and strong when it felt the Indian state was being challenged. And I still remember very vividly in 1965 in August, uh, Pakistani sent infiltrators into the valley. Uh, they came, <laughs> I remember my parents, our parents telling us, well, if you see a person, a big, tall person with burqa, but big, boy, long feet, make sure, don't talk to that person, it must be an infiltrator. <laughs> and so that was our recognition of it. But the infiltrators came in, and the idea of Pakistan at that time was that through these infiltrators, that they would get the people of Kashmir United, the Muslims United, to challenge the Indian state. They did not realize that Kashmiri people want 
do not want to be affiliated with Pakistan. They just want the right to determine what they would like to do. So most of the people really ignored the infiltrators, but there was a very, there is this neighborhood which is still to this day is a very separatist neighborhood, and they gave shelter to the infiltrators. So we woke up one middle of one night. Uh, in the evening, there used to be all this shelling between the infiltrators and the, and the Indian Army. One night we woke up, the sky was vivid with red, red uh, color. The Army had set the whole neighborhood on fire. And so you have had this kind of cycle of, of domination and resistance and more resistance and more domination, and that has continued. But one thing which really made, made was intact was the Kashmiri identity. It did not matter whether you were Hindu or Muslim, you really respected each other. 1989, when the secessionist movement begins, that collapses. So breakdown of Kashmiri identity, despite the fact that Kashmiri Muslims rejected the fundamentalist demand for waving themselves, Kashmiri Muslim women do not uh, wear burqa, they just cover their heads. <coughs> they did not believe in, uh, agree to uh, stop listening to all India radio or film music or Bollywood. So that continued. But despite that fact, you have really a forced migration of the Hindus. And as a result, what has happened in the valley, that you have that identity there is no lived experience of the youth or young population who have grown up for two generations with living somebody who's different. And so conflict still continues, more resistance, more domination discontinues. So I really long for peace, but mostly I long for Kashmir. Thank you very much. Aboriginal art and visual culture in Canada. She works with Indian residential school and Indian day school art collections in community-based curating and research. And she is also an honorary witness to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Her talk today is called Brush Strokes That Heal, Children's Paintings from the Alberni Residential School. So please give up. trace of ourself is an ochre handprint on a candlelit cave wall, or it's a photograph uploaded to our Facebook account. What do these traces of ourselves tell us about who we are, who other people are, that we see their traces? And I think that these traces, they tell us about our beliefs, they tell us about what we've experienced, what we've seen, and they can even tell us about who we've loved. And I've thought about the way in which these traces, these marks, can somehow become something that we call art. And we think about art as these marks that matter. And when we think about whose marks matter, when we talk about art, we're often talking about the work of adults. And in particular, when we look at history and how art has shifted societies ideas of politics and values, we're often looking at the bigger history of the art of men and latterly adult women. And so 
these ideas that I have around mark making and whose marks matter were at the forefront of my mind when in 2008 the University of Victoria was given a collection of 700 plus paintings done by indigenous children across the country. <clears throat> and in this spectacular collection were 75 paintings done by children who attended the Albertian Indian Residential School. And the painting collection was donated by the family of the artist Robert Eller. And Robert Eller was a fellow who found himself in Port Alberni, volunteering at the residential school to teach children painting in extracurricular art classes. And he saved some of the paintings from these classes. Mr. Eller was uh, of Ukrainian descent, born in Manitoba, and it was his first time witnessing what the residential schools were for those children who had come to Port Alberni from as far away as Haida Gwaii and the Nass Valley and the Simsian River. And so in his class, he created this amazing space of emancipation. As an artist, he saw what art could do. And for the kids, he created a space that allowed them to explore what they believed, what they'd seen, what they knew, and who they loved. And so the painting class was not about what to paint. He never set up a still life, or they never did a figurative drawing. He allowed them to paint what they knew. And so he taught them how to paint. And so when the collection came to the University of Victoria, it was compelling because these paintings told so much about the children who painted them, but we didn't know who those children were. And so it was against this kind of backdrop of an emerging discussion of reconciliation in Canada that we began our work on the paintings. And I'm just going to share four of the 75 with you quickly. But in kind of clockwise order, the paintings are of real places. And I know from the conversations that we've had with survivors who did this work that these are not imagined, these are not fictional, these paintings are truthful. And in some ways, they're as truthful as the photographs we find in the archive. And so, the top left is of a beach of Arthur Bolton's nation, Simsian, up around the Skeena River. And you can see the logs and the little black birds on the sand. Max Lincoln of the Niscot Nation, he's painted here at the age of around 11. Things that he really enjoyed thinking about from back home. Little snails that came out at a certain time of the year, eagles on the beach, his, grandma, his grandfather and father's fishing boat, and he told me he always dreamed of going into space. And then the bottom right is Donald Edgar of the Dunedot Nation. This is the last, this is his, a relative of his, and it's the last potlatch that he was at before he was taken to school. And the final um, painting on the bottom left is done by Dennis Thomas of the Dunedot Nation. And here he's reflecting on his great-great-grandfather's crest on his father's side the sea wolf and the land wolf. And you can see the outline of the ears of, this, of the land wolf and the sea wolf emerging up from the waters of the Nitnat Narrows. And so these paintings, they carry this knowledge, they carry this information, not about um, bigger pictures of their nation, but about who these children were when they were in this Alberni school. And so we wondered what role did these paintings possibly play in this emerging conversation of reconciliation in Canada. Canada's introduction to reconciliation came in 2006 when the largest settlement was made in the country's history in favor of survivors of the residential school. And that history is codified by numbers for us. Staggering numbers. 150,000 children taken from their homes. Thousands who died, thousands who didn't come home. <coughs> $1.9 billion of settlement money. These numbers are daunting. And Canada's approach to reconciling that, part of it was to create an archive, a national archive, which has been created now at the University of Winnipeg. 
millions of documents <coughs> have gone into that archive in digital and tangible form. But when all of this negotiating was occurring, nobody thought there might be extant records of the school created by the children themselves. That all of the documents that mattered were created by adults. And so, coming to terms with this massive history of violence and trauma was huge in terms of a country coming to acknowledge and to reconcile it. So, when the university received these paintings, there was such an opportunity. And it was, a, it was a real struggle for me as an academic because we were holding the largest collection of children's art in Canada. And it could easily have been taken into this institution as that, Canada's history. How do we reconcile? We have this collection of art to look at. But instead what I did was I trusted my gut. And I thought this is an opportunity of reconciliation and redress. What if we just gave it back? What if we just let go of that power? What if we just did that? And when I had to justify this proposal, I couldn't find a single publication to stand on. All I could say to the director of the museum and to the higher-ups, some of her in there, um, was, it just feels like the right thing to do. And so what we did was we embarked on a journey that has taken me from thinking about whose marks that matter to thinking about how do we be political through our hearts. And so this is just a slide to show you that in 2010 we began the process working with UVic students and faculty along with survivors from the Alberni School to locate the creators of these paintings because Mr. Aller had all of the children's names written on the back. And through the networks, through Facebook, we were able to locate 75% of these paintings' um, owners. And through public, and so over the years since 2011 to the present, we've held public ceremonies, we've held public acts of return of these paintings to their owners. But what's happened in those ceremonies was so profound. For so many people who went to those, to the, went to this school, to went to all of the schools across country, they don't have pieces of their childhood. They don't have annual pictures. They don't have little things to put on Christmas trees. They don't have things that were done in grade three as a nine-year-old, as an eleven-year-old. So when we returned these paintings, for many people, this is the only thing they have from their childhood. And so I found it absolutely remarkable that people started coming back to the university and saying, I would like to leave my painting with the university so that we can work together to tell my story about who I am as a survivor through my painting. So even though we return the paintings, they have come back to us in trust now that they have their legal ownership um, assigned. And so through these ceremonies, through these events that we held, stories came forward. Stories that people had forgotten, that the paintings triggered, that they remembered. And in a different context than the legal one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the independent assessment process, families came together, families were located, people were passing on stories to generations. And so this kind of resurgence and healing within community that was outside of the view of Canada started happening when we returned to these um, paintings. We worked together over the last few years to put the paintings back out into public. Very, very few, only three people out of the 35 families that we work with kept their paintings to themselves. And so we've used exhibitions, we've used museums and galleries to bring these paintings out to public. And so we've had school groups, new Canadians have used these paintings to understand the history of residential schools. 
And we thought about the way in which, if we put these paintings back out onto view in the context of a gallery, people will come and people will see. Galleries are, we started to see galleries as sites of transformation. And particularly, it allowed us to bring in the concept of what it means to witness. And what it means to stand in the space of the child, a foot away from her brush marks to witness that trace of who she was, who she believed, what she saw, who she loved. And so suddenly we're not talking about numbers anymore, daunting numbers that are so hard to wrap our heads around. We're witnessing the life of an individual. And so from 2010 through to the present, this past summer, We've been building this story of collaboration and reconciliation. And it has taken courage. Courage on the part of the survivors to share these stories. And I think courage on the part of the university to let go of that power that they inherently have. One of the things that has uh, come about through our journey as collaborators is that the, unit, or the Canadian Museum of History is redoing their Canada Hall. And prior to now, residential schools were not part of the story that our National Museum told visitors to our country. And so, as of 2017, that Canada Hall is being completely overhauled. And part of the exhibition now will be an entire section on residential schools. And the story of reconciliation will be told through the return of these paintings. And so in June, 17 of the survivors who were a part of this project, and myself and my students, traveled back to Ottawa, where they recorded their stories on video and made negotiations with the museum to put their paintings on loan. And this is a permanent exhibition, so for the next 20 years, their stories will be told. But also when we were back on June 2nd, was the final closing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And when the national newspaper needed a photograph that would symbolize what it meant to move forward, the photographer for the Globe and Mail waited six hours to get this photograph with the survivors and their returned paintings. And for us and for the survivors that were part of this project, it meant that these paintings not only had been healing within the community, but they felt that they had an opportunity to join Canada in a collective act of healing. And so it's against this backdrop of national dialogue and reconciliation that we've been working together. And when I think about what the visual legacy of these schools are, that archive in Manitoba, is filled with photographs, like the one on the left, of anonymized children in the space of assimilation. And so how powerful these marks are made by the children that carry individual stories of the school, individual knowledge of their beliefs, their experiences, and their relations. How important they are to us all. And there's an irony to these paintings and how they're circulating today. And that is that as we speak, there's only three schools left out of almost 30 that existed in British Columbia. The, paint, the buildings were never meant to survive. They were never meant to be here for as long as they were. And they're very quickly being taken down and er eradicated from the landscape. And as soon as something disappears, it disappears from our consciousness. And so the irony is that the very physical traces of these schools may be in pieces like these paintings that were created by the children themselves. So if the university hadn't trusted myself and the survivors to do the right thing, the story would have been truncated with the memories of a very, what might arguably be said to be a benevolent white man <coughs> who donated his skills and kept his memories in his own archive. 
but instead the return, that act, that courageous act of return, and that courageous act of stepping forward to accept the return, created gifts, gifts of knowledge, and initiated a process of healing. <clears throat> and so I return to that question. Why, why are we compelled to leave marks? And whose marks matter? It's up to us to be witnesses, to imagine the hope of that child who created these paintings, to honor her beliefs, her experiences, <coughs> and to honor those who she loved. It's up to us as witnesses and allies of survivors to be present and to be listening through our witnessing visually of the paintings, to stand behind them as they selflessly share their childhoods through their brush strokes. And it's right and relevant that we see how these children's marks might give us all hope as we embark on some sort of collective healing around residential schools. And so this journey has taught me, as an anthropologist here at the university, not quite to check out my PhD, but to do my job through my gut, and to take those risks, and to be here in the institution, but to be almost like an academic activist within. And when you can shake from within, it's as powerful as standing on the outside and pushing in the door. And so, I'm, I'm now thinking beyond whose marks matter, because I think I know. And I'm thinking about how this act of bearing witness to children, to children's marks, might be a powerful political act of the heart. researcher uh, for Firelight Research Incorporated. Jonaki is an ethnoecologist who explores how animals, humans, and landscapes interact through diverse cultures and ecosystems. She is happiest when she is out in the bush tracking wild animals, walking forest trails, and crouching in tall grass watching wild horses. Please give it up for Jonaki. So no one could contact us 
We did have one satellite phone that had sketchy coverage that year, so you could sometimes get a signal and call out before you got cut off after about two minutes. <clears throat> and it also meant that we were on a forest plateau, so we had no way of seeing where the fire was that was causing that smoke, how close it was, or how fast it was moving, or in what direction. There was four of us out there that day, myself, David, Jessica, and Wesley. Jessica and Wesley were my field crew. They were Honeybee community members. I was deep into my PhD, hence studying blades of grass. I was actually studying wild horses, which sounds way more exciting. Um, but naklai, or wild horses uh, in Chilcotin, eat grass, <laughs> and hence I was measuring what they eat. Um, and I was deep in the PhD, just like that country. I was four years in, in my fourth field season. I had left my job, moved across the country, taken on a project that no one else was working on, so I was solely responsible for it. And I was funding it entirely on my own through <coughs> scholarship earnings and part-time work. So this was all running on me. This was my last season. I was in the home stretch, and I just wanted to finish. But you need to know that this kind of research, it's like four legs of a chair. So the fact that I had three seasons behind me, if I didn't finish this one, it would weaken the whole structure. And the time that I had spent up there had been enough to make me fall in love with this place. It's, it's spectacular. You can't see it in this photo, but it's mountains and clear mountain streams that you can drink from, lakes. It's large animal country. There's wild horses, there's grizzlies, there's cougars, there's wolves. It, there's, there's all the little tiny animals that help keep the ecosystem running, and it's spectacular. So when David said, pack up, let's go, the adrenaline started pumping for all four of us. And we packed up our gear, and we needed it, because we had a hard hike of an hour, an hour and a half at the end of a field day to get just back to the research cabin, the log cabin that was our home base. We were hiking over deadfall through the forest, around grassy marshes, and all the while we were looking over our shoulders at this growing cloud of smoke that was advancing through the sky. By the time we got to the cabin, the sky was a color of black that I have never seen before or since. It looked like Mordor from The Lord of the Rings. Um, our first priority was to get Jessica and Wesley safely out of there and evacuated. They had families in the community about 60 kilometers to the south away from the fire. Um, and we were all worried about them. So we helped them load up their quad, saw them safely off, and arranged to call on the sat phone to make sure they got in safely later. And then Dave and I faced a choice. We decided it was a pretty easy choice, we better leave. <laughs> So he went about packing camping essentials onto the back of our quad, tents, sleeping bags, food, and a stove, and I packed up my research gear into the back of my four-wheel drive truck. By the time we finished, it was already late in the day, I and mean, we hadn't taken long, but we'd already worked a full day. We were losing daylight, not just to the smoke, but nightfall was soon. And on rugged terrain like that, a truck actually slows you down. The quad is way faster. Um, David suggested that to get out of there fast, I should drive my truck down to the edge of the lake that's in front of the cabin and leave it there and hope that if the fire came through, it would jump the lake and not incinerate all of my research in the back of the truck. So heart pounding and a big lump in my throat, I did, I drove it down to the lake and I got out and I was standing in water and marsh grass and looking at the sky. That's actually the moment that photo was taken, you can see the tire tracks. <laughs> and I looked at four years of my life in the back of that truck. And I called out to him and said, can't do it, I'm driving out, and I got in the truck and started driving. <laughs> so he closed up the cabin and caught up to me pretty fast on the quad, and we headed 
12 kilometers south to a river valley where the meandering stream was wide open and we knew we would be safe there. It took us two hours, and by the time we got there, it was long past nightfall. So we got the tent set up and sleeping bags and collapsed into sleep. The next morning, we woke up and smoke cloud on the horizon and settled down a little bit. So, being researchers, we packed up the quad and headed back in to keep going. <laughs> we went back into the bush. And it sounds crazy, but that's how obsessed PhD students get. <laughs> um, it felt crazy in a way. We continued that pattern every day for the next two weeks. And the reason it felt kind of nutty is being in that fire interface zone while it was burning felt kind of like I imagine a war zone might feel. There was constant smoke, there were aircraft flying overhead, you were listening for them to try to get a read on where they were headed. Um, we had trouble getting decent information on where the front of the fire was. There were helicopters carrying in crews, water bombers, infrared scanners. Um, we were constantly wired and testing the wind to see which way it was blowing and how fast, trying to get information, trying to decide when to move on. And amidst all of it, being a scientist, I was down on all fours trying to measure blades of grass. <laughs> so eventually, that just got to be too much. We got worried that the fire had actually moved into the northern meadows that I was supposed to be studying next, so we couldn't possibly go there. And at that point I had to call off the research. And fire has a way of making you focus on what's most important, and we realized the cabin. We need to save the cabin. So we continued going in for a few more days, and we worked our asses off <laughs> to clear a fire break around that cabin. Chainsaws, hauling logs, soot and sweat. <coughs> But it actually felt better, I think, because you're moving, and that's what your body's telling you to do in emergencies. And then there came the day that we'd done all we could, and it was time to leave, it was too dangerous. Um, and so that last day, we got on the quad again to leave for good this time, and looked at the cabin, and this place that I love, and just <coughs> hoped that we'd done enough hoped that it would survive, and I thought about letting go of that research that I'd worked for four years towards, and the fact that I would never finish it. And I was glad for the, the noise of the quad, because as we bounced along, David couldn't hear me <laughs> sobbing on the back <laughs> for the entire journey down to that river valley. So, the aftermath of a fire can seem blue. It can seem like you've lost everything. And that one, that fire burned for a month. It turned out to be the largest wildfire in BC that summer. It covered 667 square kilometers, which for reference is just shy of the size of Greater Victoria. That includes the Sandwich Peninsula, all of the municipalities in the city, the western communities, and Souk, all burning. Um, and I was worried that my research had gone up in smoke. I was worried my PhD had gone up in smoke. What do you do when you lose your data? And this is a huge problem for scientists and for researchers for all sorts of reasons. <coughs> for me, though, the answer was actually in the land itself. Because fire is a natural part of that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't burn everything, you don't lose everything. In fact, it's just a disturbance. It just rearranges the structure. It actually releases nutrients. And what you get when that disturbance goes through is a release of little pine seeds that start growing into a new forest. You get berry bushes to feed the bears and people. You get a new habitat for moose and for wild horses and for grizzlies. The beaver move in, the water table changes, and you get new growth. And in my research, I'm not going to lie, it's hard. <laughs> because 
because I, I had basically had my research restructured for me by the fire. <laughs> but it made me focus on what was most important. And what was actually most important was the relationships that I had with the Honeybeam people in the community and with the land that was theirs that I had spent so much time on. And so I focused more on the interviews that I had done with them and that I continued to have and learned how to make sense of that land for people who lived there for thousands of years, learned how to put my science into context and work together with their traditional knowledge. And in the end, I think it actually made my research stronger. Um, I know I'm a better scientist for it. So when I go back there, now to that cabin which did survive <laughs> and is still there. I can walk through that forest and taste berries and know where those bushes grew from. And I can appreciate that place in a way that was forged that summer through soot, sweat, and tears. <laughs>
and has spent enough time with us to be able to tell us about the importance of the story and for moder moderating the evening tonight. So thank you. And to our seven presenters. Thank you very much. getting up behind something like this is that we often get up behind uh, this, you know, in a specific role. You know, we get up, you know, as a professor and we're talking to the class, but we take on the role of the professor. You know, or we get up at conferences and, you know, we talk as a researcher. And so we're all very used to talking. But to do what the seven presenters did tonight was actually making themselves vulnerable. You didn't necessarily see just a researcher or a professor. You saw the person there, and you saw the stories that, that drove their research. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's one more person I'd like to thank, and it's because any event like this, you know, seems to happen seamlessly. But there's one person, it's her hard work that actually made tonight happen. And that's Anne McLaren here. I'd like to remind you to fill out the festival surveys that uh, have circulated around. Uh, don't forget, because there is a mini iPad that's uh, going to be uh, the draw. So enjoy the rest of your evening.